Hey guys, Dr. Brighton here, and I am in my Portland office, so at our sister clinic, Rubus Health in Portland, Oregon, and I'm answering the question, is iodine bad for your thyroid? So I decided to jump on here. I just finished with a new patient, and she came to me. She has Hashimoto's, and she had the question that she was put on 30 milligrams of iodine, and she wanted to know, did that cause any harm? Because she felt really awful after taking it. So I want to explain this because there can be, you know, a lot of scare when it comes to iodine and there's a lot of differing opinions. So here's where I come from. My perspective actually comes from where the research come from, comes from. So let me explain. Your, uh, your thyroid absolutely needs iodine to make thyroid hormone. Without it, you cannot make thyroid hormone, which is, you know, your metabolism, your mood, everything good that you feel in your body. That's what that thyroid hormone's doing. You have to have iodine to make that. But what we know is supplementation of iodine when somebody is selenium deficient will cause an autoimmune flare. So let me back this up and say, why do we even care about autoimmune disease when I'm talking thyroid health? Well, about 27 million plus Americans have thyroid disease. No, the majority of which are women, myself too. I'm a Hashimoto's in remission, uh, just like many of my patients are now. And so all of these Americans are walking around they all have thyroid conditions, and what's the number one cause? The number one cause is autoimmune disease. So we talk a lot about Hashimoto's because it is the most common. So it gets a lot of air time, but I wanna give a little love to the Graves people because Graves causes hyper too much thyroid hormone, and it's also an autoimmune disease. Now, Graves is less tied, you know, we actually use high dose iodine to shut down the thyroid with hyperthyroidism. But when we're talking Hashimoto's, some people think the best thing to do is load up the iodine. But if you've got a selenium deficiency, then you're going to end up with a flare. And there's very interesting studies that have come out of uh, different countries, so like Denmark being one, where they were super, super smart. I really wish we would have done this in America because this is fabulous information. So what they did is they tested their population. Who has hypothyroid symptoms and, you know, who's showing up with antibodies and whose lab tests are abnormal? And then they introduced iodized salt to the population. So we're talking just iodized salt. We're not talking high doses of iodine. And what they found is the incidences of hypothyroidism and newly diagnosed Hashimoto's and even just antibodies showing up they were much higher after the iodized salt was introduced, so very low amounts of iodine. Does this tell us iodine is bad? No, it tells us that if we have an autoimmune condition, we need to tread lightly with our iodine. So here's what I do differently in my clinic before we ever think about iodine. And yeah, you know, there's lots of testing out there, but to be really honest, lab tests have their limitations, and iodine's one of those ones we don't have a super great way of catching, and I don't always believe all the lab tests. But I like to play it safe. I like my patients to get better fast, not to flare, and to feel amazing. Like, that is my goal. I want you feeling good from day one. So what I do different, I will start a Hashimoto, so an autoimmune hypothyroid, or if it's just hypothyroidism, I'll start them on 200 micrograms, micro of selenium, so not milligrams by any means. So we're not doing really high dose with these. So we'll do 200 micrograms of selenium for like, Maybe, you know, 30 days. I say usually standard is 90 days that we want to saturate the tissues. But, you know, when it gets to supplementation, that's where we can get ourselves in trouble. And what's where we, 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 totally tongue-tied. It's where we really need to partner with a doctor or another practitioner. Hey, thanks for the hearts. <laughs> I get on here and do these so often by myself. I forgot. There's hearts there. So we got to partner with a practitioner, right? Because when we get into supplements, things can get a little bit tricky and a little bit hairy. And, you know, what I tell my patients is, you need help navigating your health because when you're living in your body having that experience, it's literally like you have a book right up to your face. You can't read that, but you know all the words that are there. And my job is to stand back far enough so I can interpret that for you, tell you what's going on, and lay out the roadmap. I don't tell my patients anything they don't already know or that they don't already suspect in their body somehow. They provide me with all the data. So what do you do if you're like, okay, <laughs> I, th I have a thyroid issue, I think I need iodine, I think I need selenium, but I don't know about this supplement business. Fish, that is the number one food that's got you covered on both fronts. So the wonderful thing about like a piece of salmon is it's going to have selenium, it's going to have iodine, not too much of either, and a nice healthy balance. 
thyroid loves the fish and the kelp. Actually, I'm going to go just the fish. Don't start the kelp yet unless your sledding has been taken care of. I'm going to be cautious with that. I told you I'm overly cautious. I like to look out for my people. So thank you for the, for the thumbs up. So let me ask you, is there anyone out there that's like taking iodine or taking selenium? Is there anybody, you know, you can just give me some hearts, some likes. Um, oh, we've got questions starting to come in. But, you know, selenium is something that it's a great way to drop TPO antibodies. So there's research. So why did I say 200 mil micrograms? Because that's the sweet spot with the research. We always go back to the data, to the research, and then we extrapolate that. We pull that out and we say, is it true clinically? Is it what I see with my patient? And then we always have to remember, too, this person who's sitting in front of me is not in the research study. They're their own person. So I need to ask, does this research study apply to them as well? But what we've seen clinically and what we've seen in the research is 200 micrograms will help drop those anti-TPO antibodies. So it improves thyroid function as well. So let me get Heather's question here. Heather, thank you for your question. Normal thyroid levels, but lots of hypothyroid symptoms. How much iodine should I take? I do not like seafood, unfortunately. I know, isn't that a tricky thing? The thing about the uh, seafood, though, that salmon's also going to have omega-3s, which will actually help you use your thyroid hormone at the cellular receptor. So you can deliver that thyroid there. You have to use it. So how much iodine? So the point of this is that you shouldn't supplement iodine unless your, your selenium, your selenium is in check and you've made sure of that. So one safe way is to make sure that you're eating selenium. Brazil nuts are an excellent source of selenium. But a word of caution when you go to plant-based selenium is that the soil that it's grown in will determine how much selenium is in there. So, you know, there's, I used to make this recommendation, I'm not out myself here, but I would say, hey, eat three Brazil nuts a day because you have Hashimoto's, it's great for selenium. The problem with that is, is two things. One is, I don't actually know how much selenium's in that, that Brazil nut. I have to burn it up and get the mineral ash to actually know that. It varies greatly. And the second thing is, if you have an autoimmune disease or you have a thyroid dysfunction disorder, you likely have leaky gut. I load you up on nuts. Now you have a sensitivity. You develop a food sensitivity to Brazil nuts. That's not okay. So it, you can use the plant-based forms. We are getting so many questions here. If I miss your question, just ask me it again. Kelly, uh, one drop every other day. So you're taking, you're taking a supplement and then you had a flare. Yeah, you got to be careful with that. I'm, I'm sorry that happened. I definitely, I hate my Hashi flares. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm going to flip that. I'm grateful for my Hashi flares because they remind me that I'm human and I need to take care of my body and honor myself every day. Um, Sarah says, what do you suggest for an exact remedy for multinodular goiter? Multinodular goiter. So here's the, here's the thing. I'm a root cause kind of gal. So there's not just like one straight bullet and one trick. My first question is, why do you have multinodular goiter? Like, what's going on there? Is your, is your TSH overstimulating? Are you somebody that tends towards forming cysts, forming nodules, things like that? Could we get you doing some hydrotherapy? So I'll have patients do alternating hot and cold to their neck. They'll just do about, you know, one minute of warm max, 30 seconds of cold, repeat three times, ending on cold to increase circulation to the thyroid, increase blood perfusion. You guys are, you guys are coming quick with these questions. I better talk quick, faster. Um, what is the best test for selenium and iodine? There's no great test for selenium and iodine. So I said that at the beginning of this. There's no really great test um, you know, for these minerals. But one thing I do like to use is I like to use a Nutri-Eval through Genova. And then I like to look also at um, our antioxidants. So selenium is a precursor to glutathione. So we can look there at like what's glutathione status. But it's the tricky thing with iodine is like, there's urine tests, there's blood tests, there's the patch test. I think, you know, in some ways the patch test is, is really helpful, but I think you know, the best thing with iodine is that you actually, you get a couple of tests and you bring them together, you start looking at it. And then I also have my patients partner with a nutritionist. So part of working in my clinic is you, you gotta be part of our team. So we take a whole team approach. So no patient sees me without getting one-on-one -on -one nutrition support because the only way you're gonna stay out of my office for good, and, and I love my patients, but like the name of the game is show you how to heal yourself so you don't need me is if we work on that foundational stuff so if I'm actually working on the diet working on the lifestyle piece so thanks for the thumbs up I appreciate that it lets me know that like what I'm saying is making sense to you guys um, so let's see crystal says must take supplements for pregnancy and Hashimoto's I hate taking supplements 
Oh my goodness, I feel you. So supplement fatigue is real, Crystal. Like it is real. Where you like look at your supplements and you're like, I don't want anything. Who who else out there has had supplement fatigue? Show me some hearts. Give me some smiley faces. You know whatever it is. Show me if you've had supplement fatigue. That moment where you're like, I look at that bottle of supplements and I I just can't. I just can't do it. Um, that has definitely been me, and definitely in pregnancy. So I'm a Hashi's mama, and in pregnancy, so this is actually one of my uh, subspecialty focus. I'm one of the few people uh, in the country who loves managing and does it really well, Hashimoto's women in fertility, in their pregnancy, and in postpartum. And you know how I really got into that is because of my own story of being a Hashi's mama, my struggles, a miscarriage that should have been caught, I shouldn't have gone through that because doctors missed that. You know, all of that really was the catalyst for me to step up and serve my Hashi sisters in that way. So you're right, you must take the supplements during pregnancy. Now, iodine, what is it in pregnancy? So standard recommend dosing for iodine is 150 micrograms if you're just a regular adult. And if you are pregnant, it's about 300 micrograms. Now let's keep in mind we are getting things from our food supply, so it doesn't have to be 300 micrograms of supplement. But if I have a Hashi mama, and she's pregnant and she's working with her OB or her midwife and my job is just to manage her thyroid and keep those docs in the loop and in the know on what, what we need to do with that, which is really rad that like a conventional gynecologist and you know obstetrician wants my opinion on how to best manage their patient. Like that's integrative care. That's how we elevate medicine to the next level. So, you know, with those patients, we're really watching out for them. They're on 200 micrograms of selenium. That's a great way to prevent a postpartum flare. So you know, one in 12 women will develop a postpartum thyroid condition. It's super, super prevalent. And in my practice, I take these Hashi ladies, I help them get pregnant, and then we put a whole postpartum plan together in their third trimester and get them hitting the ground running in their postpartum. And then I check on them all throughout postpartum and I have a whole protocol around that for preventing postpartum depression, postpartum autoimmune flares, all this stuff all of us moms have been dealing with for way too long. I got you on that. So that was a great question, Crystal. Um, and talking, you know, talking about the supplements. If you hate taking supplements, start looking at the liquid forms. Um, you know, I, I try to leverage things in shake forms sometimes. So I'm putting like powders into shakes. So I'm drinking a smoothie that way. You can do liquid fish oil. That goes really well into a smoothie. So if you hate swallowing pills, start leveraging the other forms. They exist. You can get sublingual um, B vitamins. You can get liquid B vitamins. Those are so important in pregnancy. And so there's a lot of places you can look and once you're out of the first trimester you can start like working on all the food pieces I say out of the first trimester because in my practice we just say all bets are off first trimester if you can get calories in we're happy about that because nausea is real the struggle is real let me get some more of these questions um can anyone get off of levothyroxine for thyroid hey Leah, uh, Leah excuse me Leah thanks for sharing my video I appreciate that that's uh, that's really sweet of you so um Kenzie, I hope I'm saying your name right. Can anyone ever get off the levothyroxine? Yes, done it many times in my practice. Here's the caveat. There might be so much thyroid destruction that you may not be able to get out of that medication. You may not be able to get off of it because the gland doesn't exist to actually be able to produce the hormone. Now, there has been some evidence it might be able to be regenerated. There's people out there doing um, laser therapy Kirk Gare, last name G-A-I-R. He's someone doing um, low-level le low laser light therapy. There's a lot of L's in there. Um, on the thyroid to regenerate tissue. So definitely check out his stuff. I'm not an expert on lasers, although I kind of want to be because I want to say I'm an expert on lasers. How awesome does that sound? So in terms of getting off levothyroxine, it is definitely possible. It always starts with root cause. It always starts with your why. And that's how I start with patients. Why did you develop this in this first in the first place? So like my patient today, we were going back and back and back in her history. And the moment she felt awful, I wanted to know what the six months, the 12 months, all of that before looked like. Why? Why is it someone with the same genes in the same scenario doesn't develop Hashimoto's, but you did. There's something unique in your story. And so, you know, with the medication, what I want to say is that if there's any medication you have to be on in this world, a bioidentical hormone is definitely the one. I mean, that to me, so I take Nature Throid every day, changed my life once I got on it. And uh, I did Synthroid. It was terrible for me. So I'm, just, uh, I'm very cautious with patients on medication in terms of like, 
we need to find what works best for you. It's not about what I think is the best medication. It's not about what your other doctor thinks is the best medication. All that matters is what's the medication that works for you. And so what I want to speak to on that is I'm really grateful every day that I live in a place where I have access to this medication. Like, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a hypothyroid woman and not be able to take, I mean, get to take this medication every day. And so, you know, I really want to flip that story for my Hashi sisters and that it's not that we have to take this medication every day. We have a real privilege that we, we can replace our thyroid function. I mean, you know, primal days, they would have been like, getting the animal thyroid and trying to feed it to you. So I'm, I'm super grateful for that. And, you know, I just I just want to honor everyone out there, all of my Hashi sisters, if you're needing a medication, you didn't fail. You didn't fail in any way. And if you can't get off of it, no, your body's not broken. This is just where you are in your healing journey. Let me answer some more of these questions. So, um, Kelly, if we know we're deficient in iodine and supplement with selenium, can that be a problem? Sorry, so many questions. Thank you. Kelly, you're all good. You're all good. I didn't jump on Facebook Live because I thought no one would ask me a question. So you're all good with that. So um, if you know you're deficient in iodine and you supplement with selenium, can that be a problem? So, um, with, so with micro minerals, we actually get concerned with macro minerals blocking them. So too much um, calcium, too much uh, iron. These are our macro minerals. And the first thing we'll see depleted is those. So is the micro minerals. So we're talking like selenium, um, manganese, iodine. So with that being said, yeah, you could push, you could in theory, if you did it too long, push an iodine deficiency with that. So that's why I'm like, Go, let's go and get those food sources. So I'm okay if my patients are taking selenium and then they're like, oh, I had like a very small couple ounce serving of seaweed or they're eating. I mean, I love everybody. If you could just be eating some seafood, that would be ideal. Vital choice, that's my jam right there. If I'm gonna get like seafood I can trust, those are the people I go to and I look to for that. Unless I like know the person I got the salmon from. So, um, you know, with all that being said, if you're, if you're watching your diet and bringing your iodine in through your diet and you're supplementing the selenium, that's the, that's the most ideal. And so, you know, at the very beginning of this, I was saying I get everybody in my office to work with my nutritionist. It's because, you know, the things that we gotta do to stay out of the doctor's office is not sexy, right? It's like, eat right exercise. I don't say that because I'm so sick of hearing that. But, you know, getting those foundational, uh, you know, uh, food groups in place and, you know, making sure you're getting nutrient rich foods is how we take you off of supplements and keep you off of them long term. So supplements have a time and a place. And, you know, in my practice, whenever we're starting somebody after a case review, I always admit, hey, this is going to be a bit of a high supplement loaded list because you're in a healing phase right now. Most people, by the time they get to me, it's like, we have no time to waste. We got to hustle. We got to get you better like yesterday because, you know, some scary stuff's coming down the track. But if your doctor's solution is to keep you on a supplement for the rest of your life, you might need a second opinion. Aside from things like B vitamins, magnesium, probiotics, but you know, if you're needing to like supplement iodine your entire life, my question is, well, what's up with your diet? And if your diet's good, well, what's up with your gut? Why are you not absorbing it? So you know, I just want to say that piece, we're talking a lot about supplements, but supplements have a time and a place. We use them in a healing phase, but the goal is always, you get it every day just by your, your daily activities. Um, let me catch this here. I feel like I need to go to the eye doctor. One of my best friends is an eye doctor, so she's probably going to watch this and say, yeah. Evelyn, salt cravings with high sodium on blood work, what are your thoughts? So, <clears throat> Salt cravings, I'm always like, hey, adrenals, what do you really want to say to us? So salt and sugar cravings are usually adrenal. So why do I say that salt cravings are adrenal glands? So this is something, this is one of the many things that people would be like, oh, that's crazy that, you know, these doctors say that. But it's like, well, like, let's look at basic physiology. So your adrenal glands, they produce all these wonderful hormones, but one of them is called aldosterone. And aldosterone's job is to regulate blood, blood pressure. And so we do that with the minerals and the water in our body. And sodium is one of the primary ones. And so that's why when we start to see those changes in the adrenal glands, and then there starts to be changes in um, the actual blood pressure, that the body, your adrenal glands will start craving salt. It's like your adrenal glands, if they think that it's constant danger, they're going to be like, keep the salt up so I can get my blood pressure up and be ready to hustle and run and get out of a dangerous environment right away. Keep the sugar coming so that I have stores in my body. So if the famine comes or if I've got to run, like know this, your body doesn't hate you. It's not rebelling against you. Your body loves you and it wants to survive. So 
every mechanism, everything that seems like this is wrong, this is off, we have to ask why. I go so dang deep on that until there's like nothing left because I want to know why. And when I've got the why, I've got the root cause, and when I've got that, and I can hand it over to you and say, here's the pathway, here, here's the journey you need to go on to get well, like patience just take off. It's amazing, the transformation. And that's something I do so very different in my clinic. I don't own your successes. I don't own your failures. Like, this is your journey. And it's not for me to take those steps every day. And more importantly, every doctor should recognize before they're like, I healed this patient. Were you there taking the supplements every day? Were you there preparing the salad? Were you there doing? No, no doctors. We weren't doing any of that. We were laying out the pathway and the patient took every step. So we need to back up this whole medicine thing and say that we gotta, we got to honor our patients and I want to honor you in the work that you're doing. Even coming here to ask me questions is a vulnerability. Is you trying to invest in yourself and you putting yourself on the line a little bit. And so, you know, I think in medicine we're not honoring the patient enough. And so I'm going to flip that. I'm going to change that in my lifetime. Um, Kelly, so many docs are against NDTs with Hashis. Should I insist on it? I've tried to armor, felt incredible for six days on it. Let's see, I'm going to click the see more. Um, any ideas? And then, and, then you ha and then had a horrible reaction. Was that horrible reaction about two weeks after you started it, Kelly? You can just tell me yes or no. Also tried Levo, but never felt right on it. Probably not converting to T3. Would love to try Naturethroid, but my endo says Synthroid. Of course, your endo does. He's scared of T3. Am I doing harm to myself? by not taking a thyroid med when my numbers are technically in range, but my TSH is on the high end, T3 on low end. Woo, okay, that's a lot of stuff, so let me go back up. Okay, so what I will say about that, so some people will say uh, Hashimoto's patients can react to natural desiccated thyroid hormone. True, how many though? Less than like 1%, I mean, it's really, really low. And I will also say that, uh, so yeah, again, let's go back to this like, Endo, I don't care if you like Synthroid, Natural Doctor, I don't care if you like Natural Desiccated Thyroid, I don't care what you like, what works for the patient. And you're telling me right now Synthroid doesn't work for you, so why are they not listening to you? Like, you live in your body every day. You're the only one that knows if it's working. I don't care what their tests say. You tell me you're not feeling well, my, my job is to be like, why? What, what else is going on? So, Honestly, there's no reason a Hashimoto's patient can't at least try natural desiccated thyroid hormone. Let me see if you answered my question about how long. I don't know if you're still on here, Kelly. So um, let me just, I'm trying to see how long she was on. Okay, so let me just say something about crashing on thyroid medication. When you go on thyroid medication, whoosh, cracks the whip on your adrenal glands big time. It, and this is well documented in conventional uh, medicine. So in conventional medicine, they know you can induce an adazonian crisis on someone. <laughs> what does all those words mean, Dr. Bryden? So all that means is you can crash someone's adrenals so bad you put them in the hospital if you give thyroid hormone. So that's why your endo is cautious about giving you T3. He knows T3 will do that. So respect to him for not you know, operating outside of what his comfort level is, his scope. And, but I would say it's time to refer you. I don't, I just had to, I just, someone called me and I had to turn it off and I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm still, if that, if that was there for you guys. Um, my first Facebook live, someone's called me, uh, during all that. So what I was going to say, you know, about that is that it's, it's time for you to find a second opinion. You gotta, you gotta see someone else. Now the crash is likely your adrenal glands weren't supported first. So let me give you this little tip with my patients. Um, I actually had a patient today with a TSH, um, over five. We're starting really low dose thyroid, but I'm like, We've got to support your adrenal glands because her cortisol is almost flatlined. If I went to like 65 milligrams, what she probably needs, after that time, she would totally crash. So if you didn't hear that, um, she would feel well. So if you feel well for two weeks and then you crash after thyroid medication, your adrenals. You've got to revisit your adrenals. Um, my T3, T4 stays low, T3 stays high on armor. We see that a lot. If your T3 is fine and your T4 is hovering like around one, you know, there's, I don't get as worried about that. We'll see that with natural desiccated thyroid hormone. Here's why. You've got healthy levels of T3. You know, you're, you're gonna hit the brain. You're gonna say, your body's just gonna basically tell the brain, we don't need any thyroid hormone. Like, we don't need any. So the pituitary is not gonna speak to the thyroid. The thyroid is not gonna make T4. So that's usually what we see there. Um, information about working with me. Thank you, Jennifer Sharp. Um, yeah, so you can find me at drbrighton.com. That's D-R-B-R-I-G-H-T-E-N, Brighton. 
I want to like grab this like bright and like the light. Um, so you can find me there slash work with me and it talks all about how we work. Um, yeah, my pa I just had a patient yesterday that was like, I like you because you're like the non-doctor doctor. Like you don't tell us what to do. You don't try to like strong arm us into anything. And it feels, you know, when you come to my office, we like have a cup of tea. You tell me your story. Like that's that's my favorite part really and that's where like my highest and best self is is in that like case review point that's where I'm like I love solving the mystery with people um, Jamic you said hot flashes I'm not sure if you were asking me something specific about hot flashes hot flashes oh how to prevent hot flashes this is my iodine <laughs> this is my iodine Facebook live talk um, how to prevent hot flashes let me just say cuz Hashi's Hashimoto's adrenal people autoimmune people listen up actually all people all women all women listen up um, when we get into menopause so when we go into perimenopause as women we lean very heavily on our adrenal glands for our hormones so have you ever heard this one before like uh, give me some thumbs up if you're if you're if you want to hear like where I'm going with this like what am I talking about you lean on your adrenal glands like is this helpful for you um, so you lean on your adrenal glands because they make DHEA and DHEA is a precursor to your estrogen and testosterone thanks for the thumbs up oh my gosh so many thumbs ups and likes this is I was never the popular kid in school so this is feeling really good imagine that's what it was like um, so with the hot flash of going on is that you get really stressed out or you have to present and do a board meeting or anything like that and then you have a hot flash it's your adrenal glands but if it's just like it comes at night and it's you know off and on and that kind of thing that's usually more estrogen dipping if you're in perimenopause and you're having hot flashes and you have Hashimoto's you need to get to a doctor ASAP because that that up and down of the estrogen and progesterone is going to cause a flare so um, guys I gotta wrap this up my husband keeps calling me I'm in trouble I'm supposed to go meet him and my and my son so I'm so sorry um, I'm okay Kelly's still here six days that's an adrenal cla uh, likely adrenal cla crash Kelly uh, tingling numbness in my body is that normal for Hashimoto's not necessarily if you're having paresthesias you need to look at muscles then I'm trying to get everybody a desiccated adrenal if you need it it's okay if you need it but if you're thinking desiccated adrenal you got to get with the doctor because something else is going on uh, make an appointment I'm near Seattle which your <laughs> Kelly you're awesome um, my nearest location to Seattle is Portland Oregon we have two sister clinics one in Portland Oregon one in Oakland California and again I have a healthcare team we collaborate as a team all of my patients see everybody on the team and they get better way faster because they don't rely on one person to have all of the answers and then Alicia nature Throid, today half grain how soon do you recommend upping the dose to get the optimal level labs normal reference range you know honestly this is what I say anytime you're dosing thyroid hormone it's gonna we got to go six to eight weeks for the pituitary to adjust and I need you to retest so we test blood and look at symptoms at the same time but after two weeks of being on the thyroid hormone you should have improvements if not definitely talk to your doctor and yeah chronic EBV you got to take care of your gut your adrenals then get on that EBV um, Jennifer yes we do have a virtual component you're not in a doctor patient relationship at that point we're doing educational sessions and we're off operating a different way call my office and they'll tell you all about it we have patients all over the world that we are I should say we have people all over the world with patients in our locations but we have people all over the world and in fact my Portland and Oakland clinics are they considered destination clinics because many people fly in to see us to hang out to get their medical needs met and then they're eating all the good food honestly I think they just come for the food <laughs> and then um, let me get this last Last one which is uh, pretty how can I improve my t3 reverse t3 ratio t3 is on the lower end of the range reverse t3 is on the higher end hibernation is what your body's trying to get you to do why that's the question we have to ask why would your body want to force you to hibernate so why do I say that reverse t3 is a hibernation hormone makes you want to gain weight get irritable be really tired you know basically be a bear in winter that's what reverse t3 does your body does it as a way to protect you t3 is gonna fuel you you're gonna go 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 if you have an infection adrenal issue a gut issue your body's gonna say slow your roll slow your roll reverse t3 goes up you need to sleep if we went in with thyroid medication and tried to like strong arm your your you know your body like I was talking about before if you did that your body's gonna your body ain't having that is gonna be bad you're gonna crash really bad you need someone to find your root cause why is your body making more reverse t3 
that, and if they don't know, if they don't know where to look, you tell them, start with infections, start with gut, start with adrenals. Those are the biggest reasons that we'll see that people won't go into reverse T3. The biggest reason that wrecks all of our hormones is stress. And really the name of the game is, how do we teach your body that the environment is safe again? And then it, then it comes into alignment a little more. So, um, Sandra, so Sandra asks, taking selenium supplements for Hashis, yay or nay? Everybody on this group, everyone that's been listening to this, I've been seeing you guys, there's been tons, people are showing me hearts. Is it yay or is it nay? Let me see, who, who knows? Should we be supplementing with selenium if we have Hashis? And see little hearts come through, little thumbs up. Sandra, that's a yes. And so go back and watch the beginning of this again. And you guys, spread this around. Share it around. Because there's too many myths and too many misinformation, too much misinformation everywhere about Hashimoto's. And like, I've been living, breathing research for like years on this. And so I studied under Datis Karazian. Like, this is my jam because I have Hashimoto's. I'm incredibly invested in knowing every way to prevent it, every way to keep it in remission. The, you know, being in remission is amazing and I love like oh, every day of my job I get to help women get there as well so hey thank you guys so much for joining me this was fantastic your guys' questions are so good help me spread the word on this let's help more women get the care they need if you can share this to at least one person that you know needs this love needs this information needs to know what's up with selenium and iodine and Hashimoto's and hot flashes because we covered all of that Please, please, please share this because, you know, I'm one person and I'm trying to, I am trying here and I, before I am dead, we are going to shift healthcare and we are going to do women's health better. I am telling you that I am on a mission, but it's not going to be me who changes anything. It's you guys. It's going to be you guys who makes that change because I'm one doctor with one voice, but you guys are the ones that are out there. You're talking to your doctors. You need to demand better for your doctors. You need to demand their medical schools teach them this stuff. And you need to demand that like the whole medical system steps up their game for women's health because the way they've been running everything has been a huge disservice to us. And believe me, Dr. Brighton ain't having any of that. So. I would love your support. Again, you don't even know how powerful you are. The more we come together, we support each other and we collaborate and we spread all of this, the more we're gonna shift healthcare for the better. You guys, you guys are the best. Kelly, you are the best. Oh, Christine, yeah, you're feeling me on that. Uh, supplementing sliding if you have an MTHFR mutation. Great question, Bridget. You wanna make sure that you're working with someone on that because you wanna make sure that you're looking at all of your genes, but you usually don't have an issue with that if you've got methylated bees coming in and always tons of food-based sources to get your things from. Uh, Lisa, you are so welcome. Kelly, thank you for all of your questions. Uh, hey, New Zealand in the house. I love my New Zealand Australia people. Although I'm told I'm not supposed to group you guys together, but I love you guys down there. You guys have been so fantastic. Um, hit me up in the comments. What do you want to hear about next? Like, let's keep it in the thyroid hormone vein. Tell me what you want to hear next. Like, I'm going to get on more of these Facebook lives. I'm going to hang out with you guys more. And uh, ladies, together, we're about to change this whole system. So I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for your time with me. And, uh, and I see questions about the iodine coming in. Uh, go back to the video, watch it, the Denmark studies, everything I talked about that. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Again, seriously, you guys, on your lunchtime, your middle of the day, to joining me for an off-the-cuff Facebook Live. I'm so honored. So thank you so much. And again, spread the word. Let's get on the mission. Let's change the world because you know what? The future is female.